שלום לכולם, ושלום לכל מי שחזר אלינו, ושלום לכל המשתתפים החדשים. אנחנו מאוד שמחים לראות אתכם כאן בוועידה השנתית למדע וסביבה, שמארגנת את האגודה הישראלית לאקולוגיה ולמדעי הסביבה. יש לנו הוועידה, השנה יש לנו בוועידה למעלה משלושת אלפים משתתפים. יש מאות צופים בזום ובפייסבוק, אז אנחנו מאוד שמחים על כל מי שהצטרף אלינו. אתם יכולים גם, אם אתם רוצים לעבור פלטפורמה, אפשר לשרוד בפייסבוק או בזום, כפי שכבר ציינתי. אנחנו היום, עכשיו אנחנו הולכים להתחיל שיחה עם דוקטור אנדרו רוזנברג. הנושא של השיחה הוא ביצור מעמד המדע במדיניות ציבורית, מבט מהחזית. לאורך השיחה תוכלו להפנות שאלות, אנחנו נשמח לראות אתכם משתתפים איתנו. תוכלו להפנות שאלות לאנדרו כאן למטה, יש כפתור Q&A, לא בצ'אט, הצ'אט נועד לשיחות בין משתתפים, ובהחלט יכולים לנצל אותו, אבל ככל ויש לכם שאלות לאנדרו, אנא רשמו אותם ב-Q&A, ואנדרו יענה עליהם בסוף ההרצאה שלו. Um, בנוסף, כתובת המייל של אנדרו נמצאת באתר, ואצלנו, אם תרצו לשאול אחר כך שאלות, uh, ניתן לפנות אליו, ניתן ליצור איתו קשר, לקבל חומרים, וגם uh, איתנו באגודה. וכעת um, אני אפתח בהצגה של אנדרו ונתחיל את, ה, את השיחה. אז uh, בעצם, um, לדוברי האנגלית, um, for English speakers, the theme of our talk today is strengthening the role of science in public policy and democratic de decision making. Our presenter is uh, Dr. Andrew Rosenberg. Dr. Rosenberg is the director of the Center of Sci for Science and Democracy at the Union of Concerned Scientists. He has more than 25 years of experience in government service and academic and nonprofit leadership. Before serving as the director of the Center for Science and Democracy, Dr. Rosenberg worked for two years as senior vice president for science and knowledge at Conservation International. He also served as the Northeast Regional Administration Administrator of the National Marine, Marine Fisheries Service at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He also was the deputy director of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Dr. Rosenberg is also the convening lead author of the Oceans chapter of the U.S. Climate Impacts Advisory Panel. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences Ocean Studies Board and the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy. He is a professor of natural resources and the, and the environment at the University of New Hampshire, where he previously served as Dean of the College of Life Sciences and Agriculture. Dr. Rosenberg received his PhD in biology from Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada, and previously studied oceanography at the Oregon State University and fisheries biology at the University of Massachusetts. Um, Dr. Rosenberg, please. Hello, my name is Andrew Rosenberg. I'm the director of the Center for Science and Democracy at the Union of Concerned Scientists in the United States. And I'm honored and pleased to talk to you today in the Israeli Society for Ecology and Environmental Science. I'll be talking about the role of science advisors and the interface between science and policymaking. And I will be mostly talking about what's going on in the United States, but I believe that there are lessons and um, indications uh, globally. So hopefully that will be of interest to you. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully do it correctly. And begin my talk on defending the role of science in public policy. And I've called this a view from a front line because for the last four years, uh, I have been working with my program and I have 24 staff in the Center for Science and Democracy to push back against attempts in the, the current US administration to sideline science from the public policy process. And that's been a uh, battle that a lot of civil society organizations like the Union of Concerned Scientists have been involved in. And frankly, we have been working on these issues through multiple administrations, not just recently with the current administration. 
So the Union of Concerned Scientists was formed 50 years ago, actually 51 years ago this coming March uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts uh, by scientists from MIT uh, and Harvard and Cornell who were concerned about the course of the Vietnam War and the nuclear weapons program. And they felt they couldn't say what they wanted to say uh, in the context of a university environment. So they stepped out into Kendall Square, which is in front of MIT, and began talking about the role of science in our society um, and, and formed the Union of Concerned Scientists that we have today. Now we have 250 staff and we work on climate and energy, clean transportation, food and the environment, global security issues, including nuclear weapons, uh, which was the founding of the organization. And the newest program is the Center for Science and Democracy that I lead. So we recognize that the US and most developed countries are science-driven um, societies. Um, government invests in research and science is intended to inform decision-making and does in many areas from drug approvals to engineering standards, worker safety, public health, and a whole range of other issues. The US, again, um, as do other countries have policies that have specific mandates to utilize science. Um, our Clean Air Act is intended to reduce pollution, air pollution, our Endangered Species Act to protect biodiversity, and so on down the list. Clean Water Act, to Toxic Substances Control Act, um, and, and many others. Um, these uh, legislative acts or statutes um, require that the best science available be used to make decisions. And so it's an integral part of the governing process. But we have to recognize that science is always viewed through a lens of politics uh, in any country that I've worked in, and that's probably about 30 around the world. So we recognize that political view is going to blur what might be the straightforward scientific evidence. Although most scientific evidence isn't all that straightforward if we're honest about it, um, but it always bl blurs the view that science gives us of what threats society faces and what the consequences of our actions might be. Those are two of the major roles, of course, that science plays in public policy is identifying threats and concerns um, as well as uh, um, understanding how different actions might address those threats and concerns. So if we just look at um, the usual arguments that affect the political discourse, one of the most common is that there is opposition between the need for economic growth and the need for public health, safety, and environmental protections. It's an extremely common argument you hear it in almost every debate over whether certain activities should be regulated, whether it be the climate debate, um, regulating pollution, toxic substances, consumer products, whatever it might be. And I show this graph because um, it basically puts the lie to exactly that argument. Look at just the very top line and the bottom line. So the top line is the gross domestic product of the United States up to 19. Uh, 2016, from 1970 to 2016. The bottom pink line is aggregate emissions of common pollutants that are regulated by the Clean Air Act in the United States. And pollutants have gone down by a very large amount, nearly 75 to 80% of those six air pollutants over that period of time. And at the same time, the gross domestic product has increased by about 250% up to 2016. So if the regulation of um, emissions from the energy sector and from all other sectors, including transportation, um, industrial sector, and so on, was constraining the economy, it wasn't doing a very good job of it. But you will still hear that we have to have some sort of a um, trade-off, if we regulate for the environment, there will be job losses, there will be a reduction in economic growth, um, there will be a reduction in business profitability that businesses will close. 
even though the data says that that's just not true. Well, I was asked in an interview uh, about two years ago, um, why is it important to have science involved in decisions on public policy? And it's actually an interesting question that I, you know, I probably do five interviews a week, some weeks, many more than that. And no one had ever asked me that before. It was also a nice chance to have a picture of myself dressed as a spy, which is what this picture looks like. But um, I answered the question by saying that if you don't have science and technical information in the decision process, then you're going to make a wholly political decision. And that's because science essentially provides the sideboards on a decision making. It provides the, the, the limitations you must make your decision within these boundaries because the scientific evidence says, if you don't, you won't be addressing the problem that the decision is supposed to be addressing. And if you take away those sideboards or guideposts from science, then it becomes a political decision that's just made based on who has the most political interest. Now we always know that politics is involved in the decision process, but if you remove science, then you removed any chance of actually constraining that decision by the actual evidence at hand. And unfortunately, we've seen a lot of that in many administrations, including the current administration in the US, and I would argue in many places around the world. And it also needs to be clear that when you make decisions in public policy, you're making those decisions in the public interest. The goal is to protect, advance, or support the public interest. It is not a decision that's being made for an individual industry or business or, um, or private interests, or it should not be. All of our laws call for the decisions to be made to support a public interest. And that's another reason why science is to analyze what will most benefit or at least protect the public interest. Well, I said that um, public policy is always political and very often controversial. I used to be the regulator for marine fisheries in the United States and particularly the Northeast. And this is a picture from the harbor in the town where I live, Gloucester, Massachusetts, um, in the, during the course of one of those decisions. And you can see the fishing boats protesting regulations on fisheries at the time. And you can also see that I'm in this picture. I'm being hung in effigy from the boat um, on the right named the Angela Rose. Uh, along with one of my colleagues. So fishermen were extremely angry because I was telling them they couldn't do things that they wanted to do. On the other hand, my decisions were being made to protect the public interest. The fishery resource didn't belong to just these boats, it belongs to the American public. And that was the goal for my decision-making, but not welcomed by the people who work and risk their lives on the water every day. Um, but. Uh, so they demonstrated against that. And in the front of the picture, you see a lot of people walking along the waterfront and they include many elected officials who always will be drawn to constituent pressure rather than the needs of regulatory agencies. And I tell you this, um, I guess it's sort of unique to be hung in effigy, but um, I tell you this mostly because we need to recognize that when science gets involved in public policy, it will be controversial. And you're often, regulation is often, most often about telling people that they can't do something that they want to do, or they believe they might want to do in future. Um, so there's no avoiding the political controversy. Um, you just have to face up to it. Well, I've had experience um, internationally as well as a science advisor for World Ocean Assessment and, the UN, and various UN activities like the Fish Stocks Agreement and something called the Transboundary Water Assessment, but also for regional fishery management organizations that work in all regions of the world, um, the US National Climate Assessment, and then multiple assessments of marine resources in the United States. And in each of those, there may be a different role for science advice. Sometimes the role is to perform specific analyses. Sometimes it's to synthesize existing analyses. Other times it's to peer review and quality control, effectively the science advice that comes from 
um, a, a group of analysts. And then occasionally it's to directly engage with policymakers. So let's take some examples of that to perform a specific analysis, um, maybe understanding what the status of a marine resource is, say in the Indian Ocean, working through the Indian Ocean uh, Fisheries Commission. Um, major resource in the Indian Ocean is tuna. Uh, how are the tuna stocks doing? There is a group that analyze, and I help um, review it, analyze the status of tuna resources in the Indian Ocean. A synthesis of existing information uh, would come from something like the IPCC assessment of climate, which basically is based on published research and widely accepted data. It includes as well an element of peer review and quality control, but primarily the IPCC is a synthesis of existing information. But the US National Climate Assessment also synthesizes that information, but has a strong component of peer review and quality control because of information coming from federal agencies. And that's true for many of the analyses that are related to um, some of our national laws on pollution reduction or management of natural resources and so on. And then finally, there are bodies that directly engage with policymakers. Um, that's true in some of the UN uh, negotiations where the science advisory bodies are directly engaging with, if you like, the, the member states um, in a particular UN forum. So Bill Clark at Harvard has um, a very well-known paper that describes independent science advice as salient, credible, and legitimate. Salient meaning it's relevant to the issue at hand. Credible means it's developed in a way that um, is believable. And legitimate means that it has a legitimate or an actual defined role in the process. And in order to meet those criteria of saliency, credibility, and legitimacy, it's important that science advisors be appointed for their technical knowledge, not because they are representing one group or one point of view. It's critically important that the terms of reference, the description of what the task is, um, is clear. In other words, this understanding by those who are asking for advice and the advisors about what um, they're being asked to advise on. Um, it's also important that the advisors themselves demand independence from political interference. If you can't do that, then you have no safeguards that in fact your scientific advice will come through as intended. Now, obviously, once the scientific advice is given, there's going to be a political decision made. But this is about um, actually crafting the advice itself. Uh, where you want to insist on an independence from political interference. Uh, straightforward that there be adequate resources and it must be carried as far as possible to have a dis diversity of perspectives in the advisory process. And that means people from different fields and disciplines in science, but it also may, may mean bringing in traditional knowledge um, and you know, in the US and in Canada and other places, indigenous knowledge and so on, which can be very important in bringing in um, a diversity of uh, perspectives about what the science actually means. And in fact, a good scientist would look at what has been well known over periods of time to understand the results they get from their scientific work. Well, in the United States, if you were looking at air pollution research, the way this process would work is there would be funded scientific research on health and welfare effects of air pollution. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency in the US government would assess that scientific research as well as fund some of it to answer specific questions. The EPA would receive um, independent advice from an an outside group of science advisors. So the scientific assessment that the agency did would be presented to independent scientists really as a peer review and quality control mechanism who would then recommend back to the agency what they believe the best scientific advice said about a particular pollutant. And we generally have things such as national ambient air quality standards that limit the amount of pollution that can be released into the air on a state-by-state -state basis. The administrator of the EPA, who is 
not usually a scientist, will then make a decision based on um, the advice of the independent science advisors. And that would make mandate states and regions around the country to work to meet and enforce air pollution standards. In the current administration, that process has been undermined. There's been a cut in research funding. The EPA has proposed specific rules that would restrict the scientific information that can be used in decision-making to only those studies where the information can be made publicly available, which immediately excludes most epidemiological studies that rely on private medical records. Um, the EPA has dismissed the independent science advisory panel and replaced them largely with state and local regulators, not scientists, and scientists that work for industry. Um, and the, the administrator of the EPA uh, previously worked as a lobbyist for the coal industry, which is a major polluter for a number of the, the key pollutants, including particulate matter, um, and has long pushed a political agenda on behalf of his clients um, for weaker air pollution standards. So he was not making an objective decision uh, based on the science advice. And then in terms of states and regions working to meet those standards, the federal agency has also cut the enforcement um, of those standards for on individual uh, facilities to the lowest point in, in uh, more than a decade. So it is possible to, unfortunately, to undermine this process, even though it seems fairly logical on the left-hand side of this uh, slide. It, you know, a political um, agenda can actually undermine that process. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do the scientific work, but you have to recognize um, these kinds of threats to the process itself. Well, it, as I noted, it's possible for an agency to dismiss scientific advice. Um, again, the Environmental Protection Agency rejected uh, the agency's own analysis of a pesticide cl called chlorpyrifos, which uh, affects uh, neurological development in children who are exposed, particularly in agriculture and farm worker communities. So the, the, it is possible, again, on a political basis to set aside what may be years of scientific information. Um, similarly, there's a famous in, uh, incident last year, which we call Sharpie Gate, where the president himself overrode a hurricane forecast and said it affected what to him was an important constituency, even though um, the state of Alabama was not to be affected by um, this storm. And that contradicted the scientific um, analysis of what the path of the storm would be, and also displaced emergency resources because of that um, misdirection or, or um, misdescription of the, of the science. It's called Sharpie Gate because he actually made that alteration you can see on this chart just with a Sharpie pen um, and, and then said, gee, I don't know how they got there, which was a little bit of an odd incident. But we uh, in my group uncovered the emails that said no scientists were allowed to disagree with the president, um, uh, even on a weather forecast, which by law can only be made by weather forecasters. So there are conditions that lead to a loss of scientific integrity and scientific integrity in this context is not about scientific misconduct. It's about the ability of scientists to speak about their work without political manipulation and interference or censorship. And the things that lead to a loss of scientific integrity are lack of consistent policies, a hostile work environment, which occurs when perhaps uh, political appointees um, threaten retribution if somebody publishes uh, results that they don't like, ineffective uh, leadership that won't stand up to political manipulation and push back, lack of transparency and accountability. And then again, the undue influence of political, financial, or ideological forces that might censor the scientific information. So it's important to protect scientific integrity such that the public and decision makers actually hear what the scientific evidence is. In the current administration, we've cataloged more than 160 so-called attacks on science, most of those are rules that were not made on a science basis or cases where the science was actually censored, studies were halted, 
or there was data collection that was canceled. So this is a, a loss not only of scientific integrity, but of the ability to make science-based decision-making down at a government agency level. Well, there's an interaction directly with the pandemic and environmental policy through, um, if you don't, you know, the, sorry, the pandemic itself is exacerbating the impacts of environmental threats like climate change. Um, in, in many cases, uh, the pandemic has been used as a distraction or a misdirection technique. In other words, well, we can't do something because the pandemic is happening, um, which may not be at all true um, and just multiplies the effect of whatever the environmental threat was. There are misinformation tactics around the pandemic itself that are actually harming um, public health and it's continuing a pattern of suppressing science in the current administration, which is very disturbing. So you exacerbate the impacts because coronavirus um, and climate change, for example, interact very strongly. If people are hit by severe weather, the social distancing, the ability to put people into shelters, um, get into a safe environment is very much more difficult in the midst of the pandemic. And that's happening all around the world, not just in the United States. When heat waves are occurring, when flooding is occurring or wildfires are occurring, that adds on to the threat of a severe respiratory illness from the pandemic. Distraction is, um, the pandemic is using, it is being used as an excuse to weaken environmental protections, citing the need for economic recovery. Um, and as I noted before, those two things shouldn't be in opposition. In fact, um, economic recovery could be aided by having better environmental protections, because you can also put people back to work working on environmentally sustainable solutions. There have been uh, attempts to misdirect um, <clears throat> measures, including uh, environmental protection measures and pandemic measures by manipulating the scientific basis like cost benefit analysis that's used um, to decide on whether to move forward with particular regulatory approaches. And then one of our major papers noticed that there was a lot of misinformation coming out of the White House in particular around um, COVID-19 and coronavirus, um, promoting everything from uh, hydroxychloroquine as an unproven therapy to, um, believe it or not, injection of bleach as a possible solution to the virus problem. So what can we do as scientists? Well, the first thing is to speak out and not be silent. And my program works with scientists to understand how to be better advocates, not only for science, but for their, um, but for their role, the role of science and democracy itself. You can actually offer to be a science advisor. Um, and that can be at a local level, a national level. Um, and internationally um, where that's possible. And you don't have to be you know, the most senior person in your field to be a science advisor. You need to have credible science um, uh, and, and record in the, in the discipline that you work in, but there are often a need for science advisors and it's a hard job. So a lot of people um, may not have the time or inclination to do it, but it's a way to affect public policy. You can educate your neighbors because actually um, building uh, support for science um, locally is just as important as reaching out to an international organization. Support for civil society organizations that provide um, some political pushback on industry or other vested interests is really important. Uh, I'm not saying you should be contributing to the Union of Concerned Scientists, although you're welcome to, but civil society organizations, including the Israeli Society for Ecology and Environmental Science is an important effort, particularly if those organizations are willing to um, engage in advocacy uh, and activism on behalf of science issues, not just science funding. Using your science skills broadly is an important point to me. I'm, as you know, as I've told you, a marine scientist. Um, I work on issues from pollution to, um, you know, toxic substance control, consumer product safety. Um, right now, the science of voting rights, a whole range of issues. Well, how can I do that? I'm working well outside my disciplinary expertise. 
but I understand the science process. I understand how science proceeds. I can look at a graph and understand evidence and I can help explain it. Um, I can um, bring a science viewpoint into a discussion, even if I'm not an expert in every one of the fields that I work in. And so you need to think about your science expertise much more broadly than just your specific disciplinary expertise. And you can engage as an advocate for scientific evidence, even though you are not the expert on at atmospheric modeling or um, you know, toxicology or natural resource management, because you have some understanding the scientific process and you can look at and understand data. And then don't be trapped in the false narrative about being objective, that if you advocate for a particular position, you've lost objectivity as a scientist. That's just not true. I still publish papers. Those papers go through the same peer review as anyone else's papers. Uh, they're judged by the same standards. It has nothing to do with the fact that I also advocate on political issues. So that's a false narrative that I think the science community has been trapped in for too long a time, that somehow how we have to hold ourselves apart. And then of course, finally, um, particularly in the United States in this time of year, we need to get people to vote um, and to have uh, direct engagement in the democratic process and to protect that process as much as we can. I know you've had multiple rounds of voting in Israel and that's probably quite frustrating when every time it's important to engage in the process, you can't just let it go by. And with that, I will stop and say thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I don't see the video, but um, just want to say that um, the, your presentation, um, while the processes you describe are um, alarming, um, the strategies that, that you suggest, they, they do provide, um, a, I would say, a hope for a better future. Um, I would like to invite our, I know that some of the viewers have written a question in the Q&A and I will review them uh, in a second. Um, uh, you can write in Hebrew too, I can translate. Um, I would like to start with uh, one question that I wrote down during your presentation and afterwards, uh, while, while you answer, I would read uh, other questions and, 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 and ask you the questions from our, our viewers. So one question that I wrote down during your presentation is that much of your presentation is about sidelining science from public policy decisions in the US. Um, do you know if there are similar problems internationally? Well, thank you, Ori. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Well, I, my video is working. I'm not sure if it is on your end, but um, it's always a disturbing thing to watch yourself on camera, but I guess we're all getting used to it a bit more. So thank you for the question. And um, thank you again to the Israeli Society for Ecology and Environmental Science for the opportunity to speak to you. I believe that the the tendency to sideline science um, through a political process exists in many countries it, and is not at all unusual um, in multiple administrations in the US and in countries around the world. Um, it's been taken to an extreme in the current circumstance, but again, I don't think that that is isolated um, to the United States. For example, um, sidelining the information about coronavirus and COVID-19 is certainly occurring in Brazil um, and has occurred in other countries that have sidestepped the information and just sort of waved their hands and said, well, you know, this isn't a problem and it's no worse than the flu or I'm, you know, I don't believe I'm infectious anymore. Well, contagion is not a matter of belief. It exists or it doesn't, and it exists to various degrees, it has very little to do with belief. The same as climate change is not about whether you believe in climate change or not, it, the climate is changing. Um, it's about evidence and science. And unfortunately, we're seeing the dismissal of evidence or the desire to sideline science in too many places. And yes, of course, uh, I'm focused on the US because that's where I live and work. Um, but by no means is that isolated to the US. Um, we've seen um, 
you know, on multiple issues, uh, politicians try to, if you like, avoid the evidence on everything from natural resource management to uh, pollution issues. Um, that certainly has happened in multiple places in Europe over time. Um, and just because you see a, a, a particular country or region respond to one issue, uh, for example, some of the regulations on uh, toxic pollution in the European Union are much stronger than the US doesn't mean that therefore those regulations are stronger on other issues. The European Union was also way behind the US in terms of fishery management and other countries like China were very far behind in terms of natural resource management and biodiversity conservation um, compared to much of the rest of the world. So we do see that tendency. It, it is driven by politics. It's driven by special interests, often business interests, um, and is not restricted to the US. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we have a question from Michelle Portman. Michelle is asking, I feel that one of the biggest problems in Israel is that you have many scientists doing really great research, for example, at the Israel Oceanographic and Immunology Institute, but is completely divorced from policy questions. It seems that researchers don't go far enough to consider how their findings should make a difference in policy. What would you suggest to decrease the gap and to get scientists to speak the same language, so to say? Well, thank you for the question, Michelle, and nice to hear from you. Um, so I don't think, science isn't about one thing. I mean, basic research, of course, is very important to do something that doesn't have an immediate policy outcome. But we still need to be able to address the policy questions that are before us. Um, whether that be the conservation issues that I've worked on a lot or specific uh, public health threats and so on. And if scientists um, turn away from those threats because the basic research is less political and sometimes more interesting, even though the outcomes may not directly um, impact public health and safety or, or public policy generally, if scientists turn away from those issues, then we're actually losing something. Again, this is part of holding the science community, holding itself apart. And so while support for basic research underpins almost everything that happens in society from um, you know, confronting public health threats, again, through to conservation, it can't, we can't do exclusively basic research and then just hope that somebody else figures out how that pertains ultimately to um, public policy issues. Now, for quite a long time in the United States and most other countries, it is government agencies that have turned the basic research done in universities into the applied work that needs to be done uh, to support public policies. But government agencies in many places, including in the US, are increasingly not only strapped for funding, but in, in, in increasingly sort of sidelined in the process as I described. And so the science community as a whole has to stand up and support um, not only those government scientists, but also do some of the work of, of the application of research directly to societal problems. And I believe that younger scientists uh, um, uh, are, are really interested in having that kind of impact and not simply publishing papers. But I also think it's incumbent upon the rest of the science community to recognize the contribution of um, applied science and, and the application of, of basic research to societal problems to a much greater extent. There has been a tendency to sort of think about that as lesser science, and it's really the basic researchers that are more important. So um, I, I do think that as a community, we there is a culture or attitude shift that is important that values engagement in public policy. Um, thank you. Um, I would like to combine a few questions that, that we have here and maybe with one of my own. My own. So um, we've recently evidenced this growing trend in, in Israeli politics of people who kind of 
and critique the rule of bureaucrats and professionals and the way they constrain um, political decision making. And, and you talked about the importance of constraining political decision making through science in your talk. And, and Simon Israel, and, and I assume that also in the US, argue that leaders should be free to rule and make decisions based on the will of their constitu constituencies. And, and basically, the, according to these people, though these voices, the role of science is to inform the public so the public would be able to make um, you know, informed decision making, but when it gets to the leaders, the leaders should be able to uh, make decisions free without constraints. So how would, you, um, how would you reply to this critique of the position that you, that you just um, defended or, yeah. or, should, or presented? So I've heard this, this um, argument before and I don't agree that we should just assume that you inform the public and then the the public puts the right pressure on. I, I also think that it is important for pu the public to speak out, including um, scientists. So there's a couple of different parts then to my answer. The first one is that I don't think scientists can sit aside and hope that everybody reads their papers or even that they just inform the public and everyone understands. Um, and therefore that creates the political pressure needed. Secondly, I think um, that model that, you know, an informed public then informs the decision makers and then everything will be right with the world assumes essentially a, a homogeneous access to decision makers, which I think we know is just not true. Um, you know, there's a very variable access. It's not as if each public voice has the same weight to a decision maker. Um, they're certainly in the United States, and I don't know the politics of Israel that well, but I suspect many of the same features apply. Um, you know, moneyed interests have very um, strong access to, to policymakers. They also have the ability to put lobbyist experts in every single policymaker's office every day of the week and in every public hearing and every other session, which most members of the public have no possibility of doing and so on. And then uh, an additional part of my answer is, I, I just think it's unreasonable to expect that the public will you know, become more educated about the huge number of science issues that confront um, society. You know, I'm uh, an experienced scientist. As you heard from my bio, I work in many different fields and there's a huge number of issues that I just can't possibly keep up with. And so that idea that you're just going to educate the public and they're going to speak out, I don't think makes a lot of sense. In addition to that, I mean, some people would argue, well, we just need to improve um, science education so that people understand the information better. And I'm all for, you know, better science education in schools, but I don't actually think that that's the solution to a problem. I think there's two um, pieces of that. The first one is that you know, I, I don't follow along with people of my age who say, oh, it, education was so much better when I was a lad. I mean, I think that's nonsense. Um, and so um, I don't think that it's just a failure of the education system. And secondly, you know, the idea that people are going to, to educate themselves to that degree rather than trust in someone who they believe is knowledgeable about a field just doesn't really make a lot of sense. And my example is that, you know, I have a retirement investments because I at some point want to stop working every day. That point is getting closer by the hour. Um, and so I have savings so that, you know, I can live a comfortable life in retirement. And I don't want to know, I don't want to study financial markets. I don't really want to understand investment strategy. I, I want to be able to hire somebody who I trust to take the money I have and, you know, make sure that it grows a little bit and that I don't lose it. But I, I just find finance really boring. And so I am not going to spend my free time studying investment strategy for retirement accounts. 
And I think that's true for most people on climate change and on you know, conservation issues and so on. They want to know that the public interest is being represented. But to speak out on every issue, I just think that's completely unrealistic and not what people would do. I think it would give a freer hand to those people who have a vested interest in exploiting resources or avoiding costs or whatever. The, the, Thank you. Know. you. Thank you, Andrew, for, for this answer. And, and really, um, we, we ran out of time and I, I would love to continue speaking with you for uh, uh, at least two, one more hour, if not, if not two. And I know that our viewers, we have so many questions that we won't be able to, um, to get your uh, re reply to, uh, answers to. But um, on behalf of our viewers and also on behalf of the Israel Society of Ecology and Environmental uh, Sciences, I really would like to thank you for this um, insightful talk, for the fresh point of view that, that you gave us, the in, really insightful and salient um, um, presentation, and also for taking the time to speak with us. We really appreciate it. And um, keep on the good work, important good work. Thank you. I'm sorry my answers are so long and I cut off the questions. But thank you all, and best of luck in your work and for your conference.